Dr. Scott Nissen from CSU. He's a weed science professor and extension specialist, and uh, he's been researching leafy spurge, and he's had uh, several um, projects here and with his grad students uh, on um, Greenland open space in regards to yellow toad flax control, as did Dr. Beck, and uh, he's been uh, um, involved more uh, in research dealing with invasive species since Dr. Beck retired. So uh, we will uh, proceed with, with his uh, video presentation, which is about 15 minutes, in regards to uh, the soil bank uh, seed issues. Hello, everybody. This is Dr. Scott Nissen from Colorado State University. The title of my presentation is Changing the Tide by Targeting the Soil Seed Bank and Preserving Intact perennial systems. I want to talk a little bit at the beginning about how limited our resources here are in the in the western US. Obviously water is our most critical and least reliable resource. Weeds compete with uh, not only with native plants but also with other weeds. This uh, picture here is just to demonstrate how difficult it is for plants of any kind to compete with downy brome once it's uh, well established. In the center of the picture, you can see some little tiny green plants. These are kochia that have been trying to compete with the downy brome, which obviously got established much earlier. And then on the sides of this particular plot, you can see some fairly large, robust kochia that are not competing with downy brome and doing much better. This is just an illustration of how important it is for us to uh, manage this resource uh, of water, which it being the most uh, most unreliable. Well, part of the talking about um, the soil seed bank is that it's a really interesting way to think about how we might change the paradigm of managing certain weed species. The term soil seed bank comes from the idea that in the fall, there's going to be, or whatever time of year the plant happens to shed seed, there's going to be what's called seed rain. And in this example, money is raining down into that piggy bank there that's called the soil seed bank. That is called seed rain. And whenever uh, seeds germinate, well, that's a withdrawal from the bank. And so that's why this idea of the soil seed bank kind of caught hold when people were talking about how to manage um, weed seeds in the soil. A little bit more detailed look at how the, the soil seed bank works. This is from a publication of Montana State University. Fabian Manalid uh, put this together and I thought it was very illustrative because it uh, talks about all the different things that can happen with weeds, weed seeds in the soil. You can see the very center there you have weed seed raining in or seed being brought in by wind or animals or machinery from other locations to add to the soil seed bank. Once the seeds are in the soil seed bank, that doesn't mean they're all available for germination. You, you have a lot of dormant seed. In fact, there are people who spent their entire careers studying seed dormancy because it would be ideal if we could somehow break the different mechanisms of seed dormancy and get all the weed seeds to germinate at one time. That would be very useful. But what this diagram shows is that there are non-dormant seeds. Those will germinate, some will establish and add to the seed raid, some will germinate and die. The seeds can be decayed by pathogens and fun, fungi or can be predated by birds and mice and, and insects. Many of you who have had a class in weed science have probably been aware of the fact that weeds or plants in general uh, vary dramatically in how long their seeds last in the soil seed bank. This little uh, figure here, this table, illustrates that there's tremendous variation in how long it might take to deplete the soil seed bank of a, ter of a certain weed species. Um, you can look at the top. We're all familiar with things like lamb's quarter. Uh, it may only take 12 years to get rid of 50% uh, of the seed, but to get to that 99%, uh, level for a reduction of seeds in the soil seed bank that takes 78 years. Now, if you look toward the bottom, another plant that I've already talked about, kochia. 
obviously within a half a year, you've lost 50% of the seeds in the soil seed bank because basically they're a naked seed meant to germinate uh, very rapidly. And you can get rid of 99% of all the weed seeds within two years if you were to stop any more seed rain form from uh, occurring in that particular site. So how does this work for a plant like downy brome? This is an invasive annual grass symposium. So obviously you need to start talking about things like downy brome. And this is kind of going over some research that we conducted uh, here at CSU starting in like 2010, I think. It's when we initiated this particular study, but the idea was to look at how long does downy brome seed actually survive in the soil seed bank. And we had a series of treatments with anywhere from one to five applications of glyphosate to stop uh, seed production. During the course of those years, we went out and took biomass and other parameters, but at the end of the, in 2015, we went out and took soil cores. That's what the little red circles represent. We brought those, uh, cut out the soil samples with a uh, golf cup cutter, brought them into the greenhouse, um, combined all the six samples into one composite for each uh, rep of the tree of a treatment and grew them up in the greenhouse to see what was left in the soil seed bank. This figure illustrates what we found. It was not terribly surprising, but maybe one of the first times people had done this for downy brome in a natural uh, rangeland situation. And the take home message is that really um, two or three years of stopping seed production did, didn't do that much to eliminate downy brome from the soil seed bank. You can look at that three application, um, suppressed it fairly well. Um, but as soon as you stopped making that application in the fourth year, which was 2014, you can see that green line shot right back up. And by the end of the um, of the experiment in 2015, two years later, you see that the uh, biomass is identical to what, what you find in the untreated control. The oblong circle there reminds me to state again that this at the five-year point is when we took those uh, soil cores and grew them up in the greenhouse to, to see what was left in the soil seed bank. So we had two locations uh, for this particular study. You can see from this slide that the, uh, up to three years, there's not a whole lot of difference between the untreated check and the one, two, and three year applications of, of glyphosate to try to stop seed production. However, when we look at years four and five, we see a totally different picture. We were a little disappointed when we were looking at that fourth year because we thought by then we should start to see something. And you'll notice, especially in site two, there's some, there's a lot of green coming up there. Turns out that's actually sand drop seed and not cheatgrass. We had essentially by year four, that fourth year, we had actually depleted the soil seed bank. And so that was a very sort of interesting and exciting idea. Obviously you wouldn't want to be spraying glyphosate for multiple years because what we found when we did that trying to make those timings in March that we essentially eliminated many of the warm cool season grasses and the, the, the site basically became all warm season grasses. Well we published this research in rangeland, rangeland ecology and management so if you're interested in the details um, you can check that out. Just wanted to throw this in here to let you know that we we're doing a couple of different projects at the same time that kind of came together. And the soil seed bank um, study or information was, was pivotal into what I'm gonna start talking about now. At the same time that we were conducting the field trial with um, glyphosate to determine the um, half-life or the residual life of downy brome seeds in the soil, we also started working with uh, a new herbicide that was introduced in Hawaii back in 2010. Bayer had a big uh, gathering to announce a new active ingredient, Allion. Um, the meeting, at the meeting, we realized that it did have uh, listed on the label downy brome. And since it was being marketed in the vine and nut crop 
uh, market. It seemed that it also might be a fit in the any kind of perennial system. So in about the same time we were doing the seed bank work, we started some of our early work with uh, Allion or Endazaflam. And the idea being that in a perennial system, trying to control an annual weed like downy brome or Japanese brome or even feral rye, medusa head, any one of these uh, winter annual grasses, we may have the advantage of placement selectivity where we could uh, benefit our native perennial forbs and grasses and shrubs while controlling uh, many of these winter annual grasses. And the results were very promising. This is from some data from one of our first field trials. And it shows uh, three, five, and seven ounces of indazaflam compared to seven ounces of amazepic, roughly. And what we saw over the course of the experiment, 2016, taking these early June and August uh, pre-emergence applications, so this would be three years after treatment, at the higher rates, we were getting nearly 100% uh, reduction in downy roam biomass compared to those tall gray bars, which are amazepic. And so comparing it to the industry standard, we were obviously seeing some very exciting results. Again, we're trying to get this information out so other people can utilize it in their own system. So uh, one of my former PhD students, Derek Sebastian, um, went ahead and published this as part of his PhD dissertation. And the title describes a potential new herbicide for invasive annual grass control on rangeland. And it outlined our early work with indazaflam to control downy brome. What we've seen over the course of the almost 10 years since we've started working with uh, indazaflam in its various forms, is that we've been very successful along the front range of Colorado in going into some of these highly disturbed, highly degraded systems where the predominant uh, understory is either is some sort of uh, winter annual grass, whether that be feral rye or downy brome. And with the use of this product, um, with the use of indazaflam, now rejuvra for um, use in grazed sites, we've seen a tremendous release, not only in native grasses, but in native forbs as well. And you can see the pictures on before and after. You can see the kind of response that we've gotten when we uh, eliminate uh, downy brome competition. And we see this tremendous release of, of native forbs and native grasses. So this has been very, um, very promising and has been you know, one thing we have in Colorado, a lot of states don't have, is we have open space. These are tracts of land that are purchased by cities and counties and are managed strictly for the benefit of uh, of uh, members that live in that community. It might be hiking trails or mountain bike trails or horse trails. And, and the response that we've seen in some of these areas has been uh, pretty dramatic. And when you see these kind of responses, the native wildflowers makes... Uh, even those who are chemically averse, uh, pretty excited. And we've got more and more of these kind of pictures from all over the front range where we've uh, treated um, with various rates of indazaflam, trying to figure out what good tank mix partners are. We started out using Roundup for a lot of uh, dormant season applications. We're now switching over and kind of recommending either uh, Mazepic or Rimsulfuron, that would be Plateau or matrix and um or laramie i guess if you're if you want a generic version of rim sulfuron and and we're finding out especially when um we can't make that dormant season application that combinations with plateau or um say laramie or, or matrix really works extremely well and just a little idea about, this was some work that uh, Dr. Shannon Clark did for her PhD dissertation. I stole these pictures because they really uh, show very nicely what can happen and how different tech mix partners could impact the response of the native community. 
got the untreated there with lots of downy brome. When we throw in in Dazaflam with a with Picloram or Tordon, obviously we uh, we control the the cheatgrass very effectively. But we also um, deliver a pretty serious uh, stress on the the native forbs. And you can see we turn this particular site into mostly just a grassland, which may not be all bad if you're you know if you're a livestock producer. But the one with the, the higher rate of endazaflam shows that not only did we control the downy brome, but we released a lot of native uh, forbs. thing that we don't think about very much in weed science is that many of these sites that are managed for as open space are extremely important habitat for, for game animals like uh, mule deer. And we have one site we worked on where we have been looking not so much me personally or even those of us at CSU but bold, the guys in Boulder County uh, looking at the impacts of controlling downy brome and its positive influence on on winter browse for for mule deer and this picture just shows that when you eliminate the competition for downy brome you get much more uh, leaders that would be used by foraging mule deer during the, the winter months. And obviously you can compare the untreated to the treated. You see there's a lot more browse available for, for mule deer and for wildlife habitat. So that's all. I, I guess I'll take questions at the end and uh, look forward to hearing from people who might have, might have questions.